Welcome everyone. Um, welcome. I'm the chair of the London South Branch. This is a South London South Branch uh, hosted meeting, but the meeting is actually uh, all about uh, developing a strategy, you know this, developing a, a strategy for managing non-financial, environmental, social and governance, that's the ESG bit, risks and opportunities. And uh, the speakers are going to be Timothy Bowie, Ian Hodges, and David Ryan, and you can see their pictures somewhere up on the side. Um, uh, you'll be expected, uh, we're hoping you're going to have questions to ask. If you have those questions, can you put them please in the chat box, um, which on my screen is in the middle of the bottom row, uh, a little thing saying chat, with a little red uh, one on it. Um, so uh, I'm going to uh, hand you over now immediately to uh who is it ian or is it tim Tim? right ian ian you're taking over i'm going to disappear <coughs> at this point but i'm here throughout and i'll be back at the end thank you Mute. okay tim you need to unmute yourself First, I'd like to thank BCS London South Branch for, and, and well, generally the South Branch and specifically Jim McLean for making tonight's event possible. Um, I'd also like to thank those of you who are joining us for this event, for taking time from your busy schedules to uh, listen in to what we have to say about managing non-financial ESG risks and opportunities. Um, so let me go to uh, so this is our agenda it's about us and then uh, the topic the problem proposed solutions conclusion and then uh, we hope some questions from those of you who are joining us this evening um, the the three of us just a, a little bit about us because I want to get into the topic but just a little bit about us the three of us have collectively over 80 years experience in information management um, and records management. So we've done a lot of work um, on information management systems, on uh, risk systems. Um, and what we are doing now is we're applying those many years of experience to managing ESG non-financial excuse me, <clears throat> non-financial information. Um, the, the way we're going to do this evening's talk is I'm gonna do the first five slides and then the last few. Then Ian will discuss slides six to 11 and then David Ryan 12 to 15 and then I'll come back at the end. Um, so I'm sort of the bookends of, of tonight's event. Um, so um, let's get started here. Uh, go right to the uh, go right to the topic. Um, so an H HBR article published in May 2020 identifies that a consensus is emerging that society diversified investors are best served by companies that focus on sustainable value creation and respect the legitimate interests of all stakeholders, not just stockholders. Uh, it's been interesting to me uh, over the years just to watch this transition in economic thinking. Um, some of you may be aware that in um, 1970, Milton Friedman published an article in the New York Times Magazine saying that basically businesses have no social responsibility. They have no responsibility to society or to or to people, their only obligation is to the company's shareholders. So basically they don't need to have a social conscience. Well, we've come a long way uh, since then um, in terms of now turning that idea on its head and saying, well, basically this idea of free market capitalism is no longer sustainable. And I'll come back to that in a minute. But what I wanted to say is that 
in our European Business Review article in, uh, in April, we recommended that organizations engage in a major strategic rethink in which non-financial ESG information is given parity with financial information. So going back to the point I was just making about Milton Friedman, for many, many years, the only obligation that companies felt they had was to the shareholders. And so there was a lot of energy uh, and technology devoted to managing financial information. And now this idea is being introduced about managing non-financial information because of the importance of these ESG issues. Um, and there's a good, there's a good reason for, for, for this, for this shift towards managing non-financial information. Uh, and a lot of organizations, including the London Stock Exchange and NASDAQ has, have, have published guidelines explaining to their, um, their members the importance of managing non-financial information. Um, and then we have to look at what is happening in the marketplace. Um, BlackRock, for instance, um, has decided that all of its almost $9 trillion in assets under manage management should be governed by ESG considerations. Uh, and since November 2020, investors have uh, invested over $288 billion in sustainable assets. Now, this is a, an increase of 96% over the whole of 2019. And as I mentioned, it's not just the, uh, these businesses, uh, these asset management businesses and pension funds, uh, GPIF, for instance, which is the largest pension fund in the, in the world in Tokyo, is advising its men members in a similar way as, as the London Stock Exchange and, and, and NASDAQ. There's also uh, something called the Net Zero Asset Managers Initiative it was launched in December 2020 with 30 of the world's biggest asset managers, including legal and general investment management and UBS asset management, setting a goal to achieve by 2050 of zero carbon emissions. So there's a lot of momentum in this particular direction. I'm sure those of you listening have been reading about the emphasis on ESG non-financial information and ESG generally. It's difficult these days to pick up a magazine or a newspaper or listen to a radio program without hearing something about ESG. So every day, if you look hard enough in the major publications, you will be bound to find something related to, to ESG and ESG issues. Over the course of 2020, we have seen how purposeful companies with better environmental, social, and government profiles have outperformed their peers. During 2020, for example, 81% of globally representative selection of sustainable indexes outperformed their parents, their parents' indices. Um, but, it's, but the story goes deeper. It's not just that broad market ESG indexes are outperforming their counterparts. It's that within industries, from automobiles to banks to oil and gas companies, we are seeing another divergence. Companies with better ESG profiles are performing better than their peers. Enjoying what the ACWI, which is the all country world index, calls a sustainability premium. Uh, it's interesting to us in information management because over the years, as I mentioned at the outset, the emphasis has been on financial information. And those of us engaged in managing non-financial information have played very much a secondary role, but that now is changing. Um, and what we, what we see is that the companies that are beginning to take this ESG issue more and more seriously are doing so because of what this, what the uh, ACWI, the old country world 
index calls the sustainability premium. It used to be thought that managing non-financial information was simply a cost, that there was no real financial benefit in that. But that now has changed. Hence the sustainability premium that these companies are experienced. Um, so just to go back to what I was saying uh, earlier, there's been a profound shift, I think, uh, in economics, we might call it a, um, an inflection point in which there's shift is taking place, this movement from just emphasizing financial information to looking very seriously at the issue of managing non-financial information. Because in fact, there's an economic benefit. It goes right to the bottom line. And companies that see that, again, are seriously addressing this, this issue. Um, it's, it's interesting to me as well. I mentioned, uh, I mentioned Milton Friedman and also Klaus Schwab, who's the uh, president and founder of the world of the, of the WEF. Um, he, he said, uh, in fact, he's written a book on what he calls stakeholder capitalism. Uh, and, he, and he says that the Friedmanite model now is no longer sustainable, that we have to make this shift to stakeholder capitalism. And somebody asked him in an interview, he said, well, what made you change your mind? And he said, it was Greta Thunberg. I, was, <laughs> I thought that was very interesting that uh, he was talking to her and she was saying that, look, if you guys don't make this change, if, you, if these big businesses that are part of the WEF, members of the WEF, don't make this, you know, the, the World Economic Forum, they'll make this, this shift. You're, you're betraying the next generation. Instead of leaving us a habitation, you're gonna leave us a ruin. And he took that to heart and wrote a book about stakeholder capitalism and mentioned the importance of the shift to non-financial information uh, and moving away from as I said, shareholder capitalism, free market capitalism, which he claims is no longer sustainable. I'm sure we'll be hearing more about this later in the year because as you know, the WF, WEF has moved its main meeting to later in the year. Um, so what, what's the problem? Um, the problem is the inaccessibility of non-financial data. So, um, for instance, there are uh, people like uh, Robert Eccles, for instance, who was saying the problem with businesses now, they're excellent at managing financial information. But as soon as investors start to ask them for non-financial data, they're almost at a loss. They, they don't quite know how to deal with, with that issue. Um, and that's where we, that's, that's where we see the value of information management and managing non-financial data. So with that, I'd like to turn you over to my colleague, Ian Hodges. Ian? Thanks, Tim. Uh, yeah, so before going on to look at how you can put together a sound program for ESG reporting, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that supply chain reporting remains one of the biggest challenges of running a successful ESG program. Nothing about ESG is easy, of course, but collecting timely, verified and accurate data from suppliers will remain a considerable challenge for the foreseeable future. And it is failures in the supply chain to meet ESG standards, which will most often embarrass global businesses. There is no shortage of examples, with Manchester-based fast fashion brand Boohoo being one of the more spectacular in having one billion pounds wiped off the value of the company when shares fell 23% after some problematic revelations about their supply chain. And I think it's also important to consider that ESG is not the only reason. Oops, sorry, just a minute. Right, sorry. Um, 
And it's also important to consider the ESG is not the only reason to shine more penetrating light on supply chain management. Our current pandemic has seen many manufacturing firms struggle to remain operational as their complex supply chains buckled. And they learned in some cases for the first time of key dependencies of their suppliers. Uh, next slide, please. So now look at uh, ways in which quarterly financial reporting can include ESG-driven long-term and sustainable value creation. NASDAQ, in a recent guide to ESG reporting, have said the ESG data universe is still expanding at an astounding rate. And they go on to say new topics are still emerging and the connections between company operation and downstream impact are being made clear. Since the previous version of this guide, the, um, the guide on ESG reporting, we have seen new KPIs focus on human rights, anti-slavery, data privacy, tax and payments to governments, water stewardship and so on, all under the collective label of ESG. Gathering information related to such a wide range of subjects, in addition to data related to, for example, greenhouse gas emissions, board and management climate oversight, gender diversity, child and forced labour and supplier code of conduct means that the best systems are capable of drawing information from a wide array of structured and unstructured data sources. So to this end, the International Integrated Reporting Council recommends that organisations invest in information management systems that can be used to improve the ability to search, access, combine, connect, customize, reuse, and analyze information. With such a broad remit, the question, of course, becomes where to begin. Next slide, please. Yep. Uh, Defining an ESG strategy focuses the organization's mind upon its most important ESG issues and the risks and opportunities associated with them, while simultaneously providing it with a context for analyzing their effect on the company's means for achieving its business objectives. Once management has defined its ESG strategy, it should communicate it throughout the organization, identifying the risks and opportunities that flow from the strategy and asking for additional comments. There may be complex reasons that ensure a business cannot suddenly stop doing something, such as ceasing production relying on coal-fired power plants. So what must the company do to convince investors of its future commitment to the use of, say, hydrogen technology, towards which it is currently transitioning? Simply stating this plan in a glossy financial statement or on the organization's website is insufficient, since savvy institutional investors such as BlackRock will cynically suspect greenwashing. A convincing narrative must be supported by convincing data. And I suppose with um, last month's court ruling in, um, in the Netherlands against Royal Dutch Shell, there has to be a reasonable timeline. It cannot be pushed out indefinitely. Next slide, please. Institutional investors are going to become increasingly powerful players in, the, in this field. In the UK, total private pension wealth amounted to £6.1 trillion in the two years to March 2018. Uh, they the latest figures I could find. And the total investment portfolio of UK insurance companies was £1.9 trillion in 2018 also. For comparison, the GDP of the UK that year was £2.8 trillion. These are vast sums of money that underline the significance of institutional investment in the various financial markets and in the wider economy. It is clear that the decisions that institutional investors make have ramifications beyond the fundamental buy, sell, hold, maximization of investment returns. The sums invested are large enough to influence any major corporate, with institutional investors now increasingly coming under pressure to consider ESG any business looking to attract their investment will feel obligated to report on ESG 
along with their traditional financial reporting. A UN report entitled Fiduciary Duty in the 21st Century pulls no punches in its forthright advocacy of ESG, even to the extent of saying that to characterize ESG as non-financial reporting is an outdated perception, which Tim was discussing at the, uh, at the top of the talk. Instead, the report argues that we must now regard ESG as a measure of long-term value. And I quote them here, failure to consider long-term investment value drivers, which include environmental, social and governance issues in investment practice is a failure of fiduciary duty. When Standard Life Aberdeen sold all its shares in Boohoo in mid-July 2020, it did so on ESG grounds, namely that such appalling working conditions are not only unacceptable, but also unsustainable. And saying that Boohoo's response regarding those conditions being made public was, and I quote them, inadequate in scope, timeliness, and gravity. Next slide, please. As investors, institutional and otherwise, step up demands for ESG reporting, reporting itself will come under greater scrutiny. And questions of materiality will drive greater precision and more exacting metrics. After all, if investment decisions are now going to be made, at least in part, on ESG stand statements, then the reporting relating to them is material. Inaccurate and or misleading claims will have impact, important implications for those businesses, which make them potentially result in reputational damage and regulatory sanctions. And uh, we're now seeing a number of um, the major legal firms looking at the likely changes in the regulatory landscape. Um, it's, it's, it's coming, it's going to, it's going to make some, some significant changes in, in the coming years. When a business first looks at an ESG issue, it's is difficult to see it whole, it's like a ball. Your view is of a single point, the point at which you were looking. And there will always be something hidden, the dark side of the moon as were. Well. To see the issue whole, you must be able to rotate it so that you can see it from every conceivable angle. A comprehensive information management system enables you to achieve this global view, as it allows management to gather information from across the enterprise, from different departments and business units, whose input is critical to produce a strong persuasive statement that links accurate, verifiable data with the ESG narrative. This information collection exercise should include the good and the bad. The London Stock Exchange emphasizes that it's equally important for organizations to report unfavorable data accompanied by a narrative that both gives reasons and sets out remedial action. Otherwise it risks creating what they describe as an environment of mistrust with investors. These multiple narratives form a library which updates in real time as new information is added. It is sometimes difficult to identify all of the actors involved in any given issue. So a process can be simultaneously initiated, which identifies the employees involved in carrying out the day-to-day -day activities related to it. Next slide, please. Identifying the people engaged in data activities of each ESG issue helps to create a reliable framework for establishing accountability. As organizations learn following the Enron fiasco and the subsequent passage of the Sarbanes-Oxley Act in 2002, accountability is vital to good corporate governance. Consequently, it is important for an organization to define its ESG obligations for each of the non-financial issues that it identifies as relevant to its business. The organization's information management system can facilitate this task by incorporating an ESG obligations register linked with the roles responsible and accountable for each obligation. A typical ESG obligations register would include, well, a great many things, but I'll, I'll, um, I'll give you a few to give you a, a, a taste of the, the breadth of information that it needs to cover. Um, and you get you need to identify the obligation itself, uh, covering its intent and purpose, the relevant provision taken from the appropriate ESG frameworks, the obligation type, its status, its source. So is it legislative, for instance, regulatory? Is it an internal policy? 
relevant business units, the department, the role, what internal controls um, apply, what standards, policies, etc. Um, what, what topic it would fall under. So is it greenhouse gas emissions, um, board and management climate oversight, gender diversity, child and forced labor, supply code of conduct and so on. Internal audit ranking priority, verifiable evidence such as data support reaching GHG targets and comments useful for sharing knowledge. So a broad sweep of um, significant data there. Next, uh, the ESG obligation for registry should also include automated alerts where appropriate to flag areas of medium to high risk. Over to you, David. Uh, thanks very much, Ian. And next slide, please. So if we look at the internal controls and governance, and first of all, within that, ensuring accountability and meeting ESG objectives. We can see that internal controls provide the checks and balances for ensuring accountability and are vital for meeting non-financial ESG objectives. Organisations are accustomed to applying the COSO internal control framework for financial reporting. So it's important to agree an appropriate framework for reporting non-financial ESG information. One solution would be to simply adapt COSO for this purpose, since it's an internationally recognized standard. COSO itself anticipated the value of its applicability to, quote, other important forms of reporting, such as non-financial and internal reporting in the introduction to its guidelines COSO also has the benefit of providing five clearly defined components, control environment, risk assessment, control activities, information and communication, and monitoring. So what I'd like to do is take a brief look at the first of these five controls, control environment, in relation to managing ESG obligations. Next slide, please. So within the control environment, we can look at the board's commitment to managing ESG issues. And this is a point that Tim and Ian made earlier about strategic importance of ESG, even at board, board level. And the control environment sets the tone of an organization. It influences the control consciousness of its people. It's the foundation for all other components of internal control, providing discipline and structure. Control environment factors include the integrity, ethical values and competence of the entity's people, management's philosophy and operating style, the way management assigns authority and responsibility and organizes and develops its people, and the attention and direction provided by the board of directors. The control environment has never been more important than it is today, as businesses challenge the Friedmanite model of shareholder capitalism, as Tim mentioned earlier. And even if Friedman's view is accepted, managing and improving ESG performance is in a company's best interest. Its core objective of preserving and enhancing where possible shareholder value. To avoid public relations disasters that impact on share value, to attract new investment or to prepare a company for sale, and to retain high caliber staff and long term engaged customers. It is in the self interest of companies to be competent at ESG and to be able to report this effectively. As Bank of America Merrill Lynch noted in a 2018 study, quote, firms with a better ESG record than their peers produced higher three year returns, were more likely to become high quality stocks were less likely to have large price declines and were less likely to go bankrupt. An observation which last year's World Economic Forum annual meeting highlighted in its discussion of sustainability and profitability. Next slide, please.
The vague and unhelpfully optimistic phrase goodwill has in the past been used as one way to describe non-financial company assets. But thankfully, there's been much more work on analyzing the value of information holdings in the likely future performance of an organization through works such as Intangibles by Hubbard, Infonomics by Doug Laney, and most recently, Capitalism Without Capital by Haskell and Wesley. The key work I'd like to focus on is the reason I put Infonomics in the middle of this slide, and that is Infonomics itself. The word, according to Gartner, summarizes the emerging discipline of managing and accounting for information with the same or similar rigor and formality as other traditional assets and liabilities, such as financial, physical and intangible assets and human capital. Infonomics posits that information itself meets all the criteria of formal company assets. And although not yet recognized, by generally accepted accounting practice, or GAP for short, it is increasingly incumbent on organizations to behave as if information were a real asset and not, as was mentioned earlier, just an internal cost. This is a key challenge for ESG reporting. Understanding the, asset, the data about assets, processes, their attributes and behavior is crucial for forming a view of their reliability identifying their cost in collection and relying on their value in assessing performance, then using these data to drive any improvements in outcome. A comprehensive information management system will need to be informed by a proper data analysis, not simply be a storehouse of existing narrative documents, a gathering of what is to hand or what is regularly already being reported. In turn, such a comprehensive system will use such data to provide quality insights to confirm the ESG statements being made. Next slide, please. So, how to manage and report on ESG using information management and specifically a metrics-based process? Well, radically, there was a report only last month from ThoughtSpot they claimed dashboards are dead and dashboards are obviously a major mechanism of reporting information at strategic level to boards. ThoughtSpot claims, quote, for more than 20 years, dashboards served as a foundational element of business intelligence, helping leaders visualize and share valuable data across their organizations. Yet even after two dec decades of tremendous investment, analytics adoption rates have stagnated at just 30% in industry, and only 10% of business leaders think their organizations are mature for reporting data of any type. This could prove a major hindrance, just as ESG requires exact and timely reporting. I'll now pass back to Ian and Tim, who will conclude by explaining how this problem and the others we mentioned throughout the talk can be tackled, to discuss how formal information management with an obligations register can provide a logical analysis, analysis and reporting method for ESG in line with accepted international standards. Ian, back to you. Thanks, David. Oh, um, as I hope we've, we've demonstrated, the dashboard you choose is far less significant than the framework within which you report. Look for something sector specific, and if one doesn't exist, choose a globally recognized standard. However, to report successfully takes more than picking the right framework, as important as that is. It requires a careful selection of metrics and an equally careful selection of the data that are going to evidence those metrics. Reporting is a stage at which you reflect your strategy in data. What you wish to achieve in your strategy must be evidenced in your data collection, both in terms of what data are collected and how you evaluate those data. The idea that what gets measured gets managed is now quite routinely debunked. Of course, if we don't measure, we're very unlikely to be able to manage, but measurement alone is not sufficient. The metrics must be allowed to draw attention to corporate shortcomings as much as success stories, and the reporting itself 
must express an intent to change with transparent targets and deadlines. Report on progress with longitudinal stats and be honest about your progress to all your stated goals. Reporting is the point at which the strategy is tested and either substantiated or shown to be unjustified PR or self-delusion. Over to you, Tim. I just wanted to come back to a point that I went that I made at the uh, outset um, about the importance of non-financial ESG information, which has been emphasized, of course, by both Ian and, and, and David. Um, and just give you a couple of quotations to end with and uh, some maybe some things to think about. And um, just the major problem is that in most cases, investors are not receiving what they need to make informed decisions. The London Stock Exchange and its guidelines cautions that investors find it difficult to access appropriate data and information. And issuers fail to understand what information investors need. And then coming back to Robert Eccles, whom I talked about earlier, uh, somebody who's taught both at Syed Business School at uh, Oxford University and at Harvard Business School, and is very involved globally in this whole issue, has said in the Harvard Business Review article, few firms have reliable systems for measuring ESG performance. The result is untimely and poor quality ESG data, which presents challenges not only to investors, but to corporate managers themselves. And then he concludes by saying, for many organizations, their ESG information is rarely available at the same time and in a comparable format as financial information. So I, I mentioned earlier that the three of us have over 85 years experience in information management. And what, the way we see information management, it should be this, uh, an information management system should be a kind of panoply over the organization. And that when an organization needs information, it simply focuses light on whatever the issue is in terms of accessing the information it needs in order to respond in this particular instance to investors. And we're often asked, well, how do, you, how do you get to that point? How do you get to this creating this panoply? And I think the important point is that for companies especially that have not either brought their information management systems to a point of adequate maturity or maybe have been slow to get started, is that a big bang approach is always a disaster. But even for a very large organization, um, the important thing is to say, well, what we wanna do is we wanna start a pilot project. But don't think of a pilot project as just one department because then the problem is people say, well, yes, they have an adequate system in this particular part of the business, but not this other part of the business. What we recommend is that you have these incremental test systems spread across the enterprise. So everybody participates, everybody is a stakeholder. Everybody feels as though they're a part of this major shift that we've been talking about in economic thinking. So that's really my final say on this. And I uh, thank you all for, for listening. And I uh, hope some of you have some questions for us. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Ian. Uh, thank you, Timothy. <laughs> uh, and uh, thank you, David. Uh, with regard to questions, what, are, are you still here, Chris? Yes. Hi. Yes. Um, I think that. Got a quite we've got a couple of questions here coming so um it's seen in the in the chat box but uh, if i read it out a question from sh okay, good. Yeah. uh do you agree 
ESG management can increase valuation, staff retention, social license and new opportunities while at the same time decreasing risk. Uh, there's a second part. What is the main barrier getting in the way of sub 500 million sales companies from realising this potential? Okay, well, I'm happy to take the, the, the first part and I'll leave uh, Colleague to pick up the second. So, um, yes, I, I think there's increasing evidence that ESG is, is a capable of adding value to businesses, making them more desirable investments. I think, you know, it, it's environmental social governance. If you're doing the social bit right, you should be creating an environment in which your staff would be keen to stay on, would see opportunities for themselves, would feel respected and involved. Um, so yes, I, I think it can, it can um, play a part in all those areas. And yes, it does decrease risk because by examining your business for the metrics you need to report, you are also examining your own your own weaknesses um, and strengths as well, but you're being able to get a look at those weaknesses and understand them better because you've now got to describe them um, in fairly concrete terms to the outside world. So yeah, I, I, I'm confident and I, th I think all of us will, will be confident that it can achieve those things. Yeah, if I could just uh, pick up on what Ian was saying as well, I think, um... We're talking about risk, but we're also looking at opportunities. I think businesses see need to see the opportunities that uh, are opened up to them in addressing these ESG issues. So yes, there is there is risk involved, but there are also opportunities. And as we've discussed in this presentation, the potential to become more profitable through managing ESG issues adequately and through developing uh, systems that enable you to retrieve the information you need when you need it, that there is a lot of potential for increasing profitability. So there are risks and there are opportunities. Um, Mano, David, do you have anything you want to add to that? Yeah, just a very brief point about um, companies looking for opportunities and at the same time, I think increasing their social license. I think you can see this from the um, the advertisements which have increased in in volume over the course of the last eighteen months about um, um, environmentally responsible products um, such as electric um, or hybrid cars in the automotive industry. How many adverts there are on these topics, and even um, for instance, recently um, Apple uh, launched some new products. But Tim Cook didn't begin this, his talk about the, uh, the new range of products, uh, talking about the products themselves. He put them in the context of Apple's ESG um, attitudes and behavior, uh, which I think is quite telling uh, when a chief executive of a major company does this. Okay. Um... SH, I don't know whether you want to unmute and express your satisfaction with the question or um, whether. Yeah, uh, certainly. Thank, thanks for the, um, the chat today, Yang. I'm actually calling in from Vancouver, Canada, so it's nice to uh, connect across the globe. I, um, I spent uh, six years living in London some, some time ago, so I appreciate what you're saying and, and, and certainly um, uh, aligned with the answer to my question. The, the, the second part to my question is this, um, in, in, from, from your context, what are you seeing as the, the things getting in the way of, of companies kind of in the, you know, sub 500 million bracket of revenues getting on board? Um, in, in Canada, there, there's still some resistance to change there, even though we can spell out what you just spelled out, right? The decrease of risk, the increase of opportunity, the ability mm -hmm. to gain, capture a social license. Mm -hmm. um, but all, all that said, there still seems to be 
um, something that's getting in the way of these organizations jumping on board. And, and part of me is starting to wonder, is it, is it a function of just too much information? You know, there, there's so much out there on ESG. And when the uneducated COO uh, takes a look, they're um, overwhelmed with information. And, and I wonder if that's got something to do with it. There's too much for them to make sense of. Um, I but I, I'd, I'd love to yeah. hear all of your opinions. Thank you. For, yeah. thank if, you. if I could go I first and then I turn it over different. to my colleagues. But um, yeah. we've recently been having discussions with uh, somebody from the, uh, what's called the uh, Quoted Companies Alliance, PCA, in this country. And these are the companies pretty much in the category that you just uh, outlined. And um, what, what she said is that uh, part, of, part of the problem is they don't think, these companies don't think this is going to last. It's a kind of current fashion that uh, ESG is a kind of flavor of the month, but that it's not going to be around for, for very long. Um, and uh, she said that's for her in discussing these issues with these um, uh, members of the Quoted Company Alliance um, that uh, it, 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 there is a lot, of, a lot of frustration. But she also says she thinks, and this comes back to your point, that um, these companies need some guidance. They don't really know where to start. Um, and uh, she was saying uh, just to me just a couple of weeks ago that, um, that that also is part of the problem. Coming back to your point about there's just so much information about ESG, where do we begin? Uh, so they do need, they feel some sort of help in that regard. Um, David or Ian, you wanna pick up on that? Yeah, so I, I, I agree. And I think because there is, you know, we, we, we have to recognize there is a significant initial investment in trying to put this together, then businesses are going to be wary that the rules might change halfway through their program or, you know, that, um, they may be not reporting in the right way or it may be not, that they may find that they're, they're in quite deep with reporting on metrics, which, um, which aren't particularly useful to them. I think, as I say, with, with, with there's a lot of publicity around ESG. There's not a huge amount of really useful information in, in practical terms of how a business would engage in this and larger corporates can find the time and the space and the money to do these things much more easily than than smaller ones and, and so, yes, yes it, 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 and when you when you think over the last three three years we've had obviously in europe gdpr rolled out which obviously affects companies from very small ones to multinationals and public sector institutions. And then obviously cybersecurity has become an increasing issue uh, over the last couple of years as well, and is continuing to do so. And at the same time now, ESG is becoming increasingly important. Companies um, in the small to medium range, as we say, how do they find the resources? How do they prioritize um, how, how many of these regulatory factors or business threats or risks that they actually have to deal with? And that, that is undoubtedly a challenge. Okay. Um, if anyone has any questions, they can please enter them in the in the chat box. Otherwise, perhaps I'll go to um, question. Um, what do what do the presenters see as the future of ESG reporting? Um, Where is it going? Ian, well, you want to take I, that on, on reporting? Yeah, I, I, I'm happy to pick that up. I'm, I'm, I think what we're going to see is, is developments in framework. So we're going to have, I think, um, two, maybe three sort of global standards, um, which will be large over, uh, overarching generic frameworks. I think we'll, they will emerge. And underneath those, we'll see an increasing number of sector-specific um, complementary standards. So ultimately, these things will dovetail together. At the moment, they they can be a bit a bit jarring. They can leave gaps. They can have awkward overlaps. But but I you know I'm quite confident that uh, it will resolve itself um, in time because 
but there is an awful lot of will there to make that happen and we're beginning to see it happening already so the frameworks will emerge which makes sense for for any business really you just be able to find the right thing and, and start plugging into it i think increasingly there'll be better understanding of what you're what we're looking for how it reports there's no doubt that we're moving to a point where there'll be greater regulatory involvement um, elements of esg will soon be required i think that's there's, there's no doubt of that um, targets, particularly with, um, as I, said, I, I mentioned uh, earlier, the late last month, the, the Dutch courts ruling against Shell that they must speed up their process of um, decarbonisation, that the targets were too too little, too too long, so they've got to go bigger in a shorter time frame. That sort of thing um, is not only going to fire up the, the activists and the climate activists in particular in that case, it's also going to catch the attention of regulators. And I think we will see with a few more cases, similar cases, we'll see legislation on the back of that. So it will become a more regulated environment as well. It will ultimately become a required reporting I think that that is unavoidable, really. I think we're we're um, we're well down that road. That it will become required reporting for any any listed business. And I th I think too that um, I mentioned in, in in my part of the talk about the London Stock Exchange guidelines. I think um, the the LSC is providing a valuable service uh, in terms of trying to guide businesses towards the best reporting formats um, and uh, best reporting frameworks. So I think, I think that is going to help businesses that they have these guidelines from, from the London Stock Exchange. Um, I don't know, David, do you have anything you wanna to add to that? No, I think um, I agree with what both you and Ian have said. Yeah. And I think clearly if the, if the regulatory environment um, becomes as clear as the GDPR one, especially as um, the preparation that was done in advance of GDPR and how comprehensive it is and how it's scaled to different levels, that would be, that would be excellent progress. Okay, so that... Uh, sorry, one, one last thing to say about this, because uh, GDPR is something I've, I've worked on quite extensively in the recent past, is the amount of, again, the amount of training that is provided to organisations, uh, both um, from legal firms and from training organisations, including the BCS, I would, I would think, on, on GDPR, which certainly um, has helped practitioners, and certainly a similar kind of set of activities for ESG would be very welcome. Uh, the next point would be, um, or is how specifically would an information management system be deployed to help with ESG strategy? Can I can I take that one first? Yeah, yeah. Um, um, independent of whatever system um, a, a company would adopt, I think a key point would be to involve the supply chain partners um, for them to be able to transfer directly their data, their, their, their statistics, their reports uh, into the system um, so that they become part of the process. Yeah, and certainly modern technology allows for extranet-based um, content management systems where um, permissions can be given for um, third parties to, to, to submit data into systems. And I think that that will be absolutely essential, especially going back to Ian's point about the timeliness of the reporting. So if, if the data is coming in real time or close to real time from supply chain partners, I think that would be a, go a good idea. Okay, and uh, what metrics will show if the information management process is helping delivery 
is helping deliver the ESG strategy. Try, try to pick up on that. Um, the so so the metrics have to really, if you if you're looking at the the strategy, the mes, the metrics reflect the strategy. So um, it's hard to say to, to give some specifics, but. Um, for instance, if you're looking at your supply chain, then do you understand the employment contracts of your suppliers? And you could be looking at, um, for instance, um, what the median pay is for a particular supplier. You could measure that against the median pay for that country. And you could have a target to say that you are going to pay the median rate for the country or the median rate plus um, 10% or whatever it is, you know, so, so they've, they've got to match the goals of the organization. They've got to be comparable. So you've got to be able to, if you want to look at supply chain management, pick a metric that you can find in each supplier. So, so they, they then are comparable with each other and you can aggregate that inf information together meaningfully. So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave to my, my colleagues to say more on that. Um, Ian, I think the point you made earlier about the, the increasing regulatory activity, I think to a large degree that, that will also drive uh, what metrics are required. And yes. th those metrics will have thresholds, I, I would imagine, in them. And that will, that will show whether and they're being met or not. Whether yeah. those will be voluntary metrics that organisations set themselves yes. or whether they'll be um, externally imposed, I think that's going to be an interesting development. Be. I mean, some already are, but it'll be interesting to see how widespread that becomes. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting with the case of Royal Dutch Shell that the court has imposed um, metrics and targets for them. Mm. Um, so they've been very specific in, in what they, you know, not only where they're failing, but what they need to do. Uh, we've got a question from Amanda. Technology is costly. Is there a specific sector that is leading this risk management investment? Uh, 500 million in sales companies. How do we get SMEs to adopt ESG reporting to work towards science-based targets when it's not governed or there's no investor pressure? Is the operational efficiency case there for cost savings? Well, yes. I mean, I think, that, um, as Tim mentioned earlier, this is this is more than than risk management, and um, it it is about growing the value of, of the business and ensuring its long term viability, and doing those things add, add value to the business. So there is there is an opportunity there. I think very few businesses, are, if any, are not going to be under some investor scrutiny and, and investor pressure. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I, any, any listed company will, will soon be in that position. Uh, absolutely, and there already are green, green investment funds. Yes. ESG-based <laughs> investment funds that already exist. But is the operational efficiency case there for cost savings? It may well be, it may well be. I mean, I think that those things are very difficult to identify at the outset, but in terms of putting in the place the sort of program that we've outlined, you, it may be that a business will find that understanding their business better, understanding their supply chain better, understanding the larger environment in which they operate better, does enable them to make um, operational savings. I think uh, there have been recent articles about um, companies who have started out being very cynical about this in, in the category that the, uh, the questioner mentioned in the 500 million category. And I think um, they start out being somewhat cynical and then gradually understand that they can increase their profitability 
they can, we're, we're talking about something that goes right to the bottom line. So it, it, it's important for companies to understand that. Even these SMEs need to understand the value of that and then find a way to deliver the information they need to investors in order to convince investors that uh, they should put money into their business. Yeah, so we, we, you know, we hear a lot about greenwashing, and I think that the scrutiny that companies can be under is, is really going to drive that out. I think it will become, in the end, harder to do the greenwashing than actually do it properly. The bigger issue, I think, is is green wishing, which is something we don't hear so much about. But it is those businesses who are actively engaging in 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 ESG and still not meeting targets, constantly reporting and falling short, but feeling as though the reporting itself is making a difference. You know, it doesn't. And um, that sort of wishful thinking, I think, will be harder to, to, to remove. But again, investment pressure will drive change. Mm. Absolutely. And going to Amanda's question about uh, do we see non-public companies implementing programmes? I think absolutely. I think um, Andy and um, not only in the private sector, but in the public sector too. I mean, my local authority, I'm just quoting from their website, they have a, a, um, a purpose and a vision about their ESG approach, innovative, trusted, safe and responsible. Um, we'll collaboratively for the approach to minimize the impact waste on us on, has on our communities and work tirelessly to achieve zero waste. So there are already public statements being made by organizations on this subject. Mm. And I think this will only increase over time. Yes, it's not just investor scrutiny, it, it's customer scrutiny as well. Mm. So uh, I think, um, yeah, local authorities have to, uh, engage local residents and any business um, that wishes to, to trade has to has to look after its customer base and that customer base will be critical of um, poor ESG standards or non-existent ESG reporting. Okay um, Amanda do you do you want to um ask any think further or comment further or are you happy with the answers um no thank you for uh for those answers um i've seen uh some of the information systems we have here in canada at the ministry level at our provincial and federal government levels so implementing an erp um a big piece of technology that will talk that will hit the breath um and and the wideness of that organization for the integrated reporting piece can be a challenge. So I just wanted to ask specifically when looking at information systems that are specific to ESG and not financial or um, your traditional AP or um, procurements, do we see a lot of uh, interest outside of the funds, outside of the pension funds looking for that information? But you guys answered it really well. Thank you. Okay, I'd say we have got a, more a comment from SH, SH. I often see private ESG internet spike when they are considering a private private companies. I guess that is um, ESG and interest spike when they are considering being acquired. Uh, if you mm. want to comment on that. Yeah, I think, you know, some of the, in Canada, at least one of the answers is the carbon pricing. We see carbon pricing per ton going up to, you know, um, not just at the $50, $55, but at the $100 mark. So that I think is going to be a big driver outside of just customers and investors, because in Canada and some of these markets, they're a little bit slower than the UK or um, markets that have anti-slavery regulations and things mm -hmm. like that put in place. 
yeah, I, I think a business that's that's um, going up for a sale often takes that as an opportunity to get its house in order. So, um, well, again, there can there can be some cynicism sometimes with with putting these things together, but at other times it's a a more genuine catch up exercise. I think. Absolutely, and and this is a point that. Um, that Haskell and Westlake make in this book, Capitalism Without Capital. Um, you know, this old phrase of goodwill, what, what does that actually mean? Um, what, what is um, an organization's assets, especially the intangible assets, when it is coming up for sale, um, using a phrase like goodwill, what will that actually mean when the new owners, owners take over? And what they're actually suggesting is a different thought process and a different approach to how you measure um, how these assets how make up the strength, um, the fi- even the financial strength of an organisation. So I don't find it surprising that um, that ESG interest spikes when companies are considering being acquired, especially if they have um, a large basis in their activities in intangible factors um, being behind their profit drive. Okay, Jim, do you, oh, I guess, Jim, before we do close, I could do an advertisement for the um, uh, the next talk when we're, um, we're linking with the Hampshire branch and the specialist group, isn't it? And the BCS Animation and Games Development Specialist Group. So the 17th of June, uh, 1730 half an hour earlier than this than this um, session uh, access to video games is so important for people with physical challenges uh, and the speaker is dr Mick Donigan who has uh, founded a um, special effects charity um, founder and CEO and he will explain why he created this charity with a focus on video games for people with severe challenges. Okay, thank you. Jim, I'm back to you. Thank you, thank you, Chris, for drawing that to our attention. But I think now, as it's uh, well past our time, I'd like to thank very much our speakers for a very uh, uh, in, in, in insightful uh, introduction for most of us to this topic. Um, I'd like to thank uh, those who actually attended this evening, um, both members and guests. And I'd like to point out that this is being recorded, so it will be available for uh, people to see again, or in fact, to uh, for us to extend to people who weren't able to be with us this evening. So on that uh, on that score, I think I'd like to say uh, thanks very much. Um, should we now gently slope off into the night? Thanks very much, Jim. Thanks for giving hey, us. Thank time. you, Jim. Really yes, appreciate you. it. Very welcome.